Okay, so um, I'm also in a little bit of a weird space because I am in Norway and the place I'm staying doesn't have great internet. So I am currently at the University of Tromsø, which is in North Norway. And I'm sort of in a public place and I've never given a workshop in a public place. So um, yeah, I'm gonna do the best I can and hopefully you all can hear me and uh, I am going to get started, but if anybody has questions at all throughout the presentation, um, please raise your hand or put them in the chat. I'll try and monitor the chat as best as I can. Um, and this will be recorded and sent to you after. So yeah, with that, let's get started. Um, I'm gonna start with a poll, which I've never done in Zoom before. Um, hi, Terry, thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. Terry, I might ask you, since you have experience, to be my assistant. And if you see things in the chat or things pop up that I don't see, please just let me know. Thanks for letting me put you on the spot without telling you. OK, so I'm assuming this works where I launched the poll. Yeah, and then you should just be able to answer who you are. Um, I think you can choose multiple ones. And I don't expect that we all know who we are yet. So it's okay to be figuring it out. Okay, this is great. Um, I'm really curious about the people who work in fields related to nature sort of and what um, your background is and, and what you're up to. Um, so the presentation today, I realized that I probably could have split it into two and done one specifically for beekeepers and one specifically for teachers, um, but I didn't think of that in advance. So we are going to um, do the best we can and hopefully both teachers and beekeepers and um, other people as well get something useful out of this presentation. Okay. So mostly beekeepers and then lots of teachers and educators. Okay, great. Okay, so my name is Megan Orman and I am a, a PhD student at the University of Pittsburgh and I study actually psychology and education. Um, so I don't study bees and I'm not an entomologist, but at, when I lived in Florida, um, which was before I moved to Pittsburgh, I was a master beekeeper in the University of Florida's master beekeeper program. So I started keeping bees um, actually while I was a preschool teacher. So I've been a Montessori toddler teacher. I did that for five years in Florida and really loved it. Um, and at the same time, I also started keeping bees and I really loved sort of doing both at the same time, having bees at home and then coming to school and working with the kids. And I started to think a lot about what education for kids could look like around bees. And then I moved to Pittsburgh and started graduate school and then sort of never came back to this question until now. Um, in my PhD program at Pitt though, I study kids in nature. So how kids think about and connect to nature. And that's what brought me to Iceland. So I've been in Iceland for the last nine months conducting research there on kids in nature. And it's fascinating, but I won't go into it today. Um, and then I'm currently in Norway doing a little bit of work here as well. And then I'll be back in Pittsburgh this summer. So at Pitt, I'm also co-chair of the Pollinator Habitat Advisory Committee. So we help uh, the Pitt Sustainability Council think about ways to encourage and promote um, pollinator health on Pitt's campus. And that's sort of what I'm here today as a representative of our Pollinator Habitat Advisory Committee. Uh, in a few weeks, it will be National Pollinator Week in the US. And we decided that there's way too much to talk about in just a week. So we're gonna go ahead and make an entire month out of it. And I'm the one that's sort of leading this off by talking about um, bees and kids and how to introduce kids to bees, um, not physically in a bee yard, but sort of educationally, probably in a classroom or something like that. So that was my sort of introduction and we already did um, the Zoom poll. So the next thing I want us to do is to, you can use your camera and follow this QR code, or you can go to menti.com and enter this code. 
And there's going to be two slides. And the first one is just going to ask you to enter a few words or phrases that you think about when you think of bees. So I'll put this in the chat and then I'm gonna go share the screen. Okay. <laughs> Fascinating, yeah, native pollinators. Important. Cute, okay, that's great. Dying, yes. Connection. Yeah. Okay, so honey, yes. I think that is at a lot of people's minds at the front. And this is actually what got me into bees and beekeeping was around 10 years ago, I was eating honey and I was just very curious about where it came from. And so I started Googling it and reading about how bees make honey. And that was it. I was sold. Um, and I just started reading <coughs> about bees and then I uh, eventually got my own hives and yeah, that was the beginning of that. Okay. So next question. All right. Flowers, honey, stings. Yes, of course. And important. Okay. And then the next question. What do you feel or think about when you think about bees and children together? <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Allergy worries, definitely. Wow, this is really fascinating. I've never asked this question um, before or seen results. So this is, to me, this is data. It's very exciting. So learning, education, also important. I agree. Um, safety, fear, respect. So yeah, there's sort of this positive notion of learning, education, curiosity, and things like that. But then the very real reality of respect, safety, things, fear, um, and all of those components that go with it. So uh, thank you very much for, for helping me to think about these questions. Um, I'm going to come back through these later, hopefully, and um, we'll be able to use this to think about ways to, to move forward with research and with talking to kids about bees. Okay, so why kids and bees? I think I'm gonna start with this question since this is what we're talking about today. Um, I think some of the obvious things are, are kids are really curious and bees are really important, right? And I think this came up in both as a uh, menti polls that we just did, curiosity and importance, right? We know bees are important. They play really critical roles in our ecosystems. They help to pollinate at least a third of the food that we eat. Um, and then they pollinate the food that our, um, some of our food eats. So if you eat meat, there's a good chance that it eats food that's pollinated by bees. So bees are really important for those sort of functional reasons for us to be able to continue to eat. Um, but then they also are really important for helping to just stabilize ecosystems and pollinate flowers, even if we don't eat them. Um, and those flowers might be important for birds and, and other animals in the ecosystem. So bees are really important, but I think why bees and kids? So um, 
sort of what I'm studying now is the formation of environmental attitudes and behaviors. And we see that this begins in early childhood and continues throughout adolescence. So, and then also exposure to nature in childhood fosters nature connection and conservation behaviors. So behaviors like recycling, um, wanting to garden, wanting to, to reuse things, wanting to reduce um, pollution, things like that are related to kids' exposure to nature in childhood. So this is uh, some of the research that I've been doing in Iceland, which is really exciting, is how kids develop environmental attitudes and behaviors. I study preschoolers, so I worked with toddlers. I'm studying preschoolers now, so I'm very interested in early childhood. Um, but it seems like these early experiences are really important for kids. Um, they get sort of solidified in the brain, and then the kid can continue to work with that as they grow older. Adolescence is a really tricky time. We do see like a drop in nature connection at this time. And I think uh, social relations become a lot more important. So if you're working with adolescents, we can definitely talk about that specifically. Um, what I'm going to do today is sort of walk you through a workshop I would do with kids. I would say it's basically um, really good for kids four to 12 about. And then as they get younger, you just would want to simplify some things. And as they get older, you can sort of make things a little bit more complex and deep. Um, so this is why it's really important. And then also this last one of overcoming the fear or the yuck factor of these. Um, so education goes a long ways, but you'll see that there's a star there. And on the next slide, I'm going to talk about what that star means and why it's really important to not necessarily push kids um, in a direction that's unsafe for them to go. So I'm going to go through this and then I'm going to pause and, and take questions for a second. I do have a lot of slides and I don't need to go through them all. I just have information and happy to share it. Um, but also if there are questions, I would love to, to have this be a little bit more interactive. So what I'm going to do is share sort of a workshop that I would do with kids. And the first part of the workshop is sort of more talking and engaging. And then the second half is more of these learning centers. But throughout all of them, I think that these are the 11 things that I would want to emphasize um, for you to focus on. So if you're a teacher, you're probably like, duh, this is kind of obvious to me. But for beekeepers, this may not be as obvious. And then for some of the bee things that I talk about, that might be more obvious for the beekeepers, but less obvious for the teachers. So um, the first thing I think that's really important to know is that when you walk into a room full of kids, you are going to become the director of their attention. So for this, what I want you to think about is imagine that your eyes are like headlights and wherever you point them is where the kid's attention is gonna go. So as the driver, of course, you decide where you're pointing them, but know that kids aren't always listening to what's coming out of your mouth, but they will follow your attention. And this is especially true with the younger kids, but then also with the older ones. So just know that you are in control and you have to be confident in your sort of role as director of attention. Um, and you will have to do some acting with kids, not necessarily being fake, but just maybe being a little bit more, um, yeah, engaging and excited about what you're talking about to be able to direct their attention. So then you're the director of attention. So just remember that wherever your eyes go is where they're gonna follow. Uh, include movement. So when you're talking to kids about bees, it's good to have them get up. But if things start to sort of spiral, um, remember you're the director of attention. So you can just bring all of their attention and sort of energy back um, into a point where it becomes manageable again. I think having a loose plan is really important. Um, so if you're a beekeeper and you're talking to a classroom of kids, of course you want to um, have sort of an idea of what you're gonna say but then also follow the kids. So if you have your headlights on and you're following your plan and then they pull you off to the side, it's okay to show your lights there and sort of see what's happening and then decide to keep following that or to bring it back to the plan. Um, so I think it's good to have a loose plan, but then also follow the kids. For me, this one's a big one. Use real and big language. So endophallus is the male reproductive organ and then big hyperpharyngeal gland. Those are the glands on the worker bee heads that secrete um, all the royal jelly that the queens eat. And I think that it's important to use this language with kids to show them that you trust them um, with these big words, but I wouldn't lecture them about these. And actually research has found that um, just saying names in a sort of really scientific way is kind of boring to kids. 
Um, so you can use this, these words sort of in real conversation, um, define them, and then sort of move on. I like to use hands-on activities with lots of sensory items. So kids, their brains are wired such that they are always taking in um, so much sensorial information at once. And it's really good to give them opportunities to connect concepts across senses. So to have different sensorial activities that can help them connect um, yeah, what they're learning using all of their senses, certainly not just hearing us talk. Uh, I use learning stations. I'm gonna go through those today. I like to specialize my presentation based on the audience. Um, play is obviously really important. So not just to keep kids engaged, but it's also how the brain learns um, by sort of stretching beyond what we know um, and incorporating it into, yeah, new styles of, of communication. And then this one, trauma-informed, is where the asterisk came in from the last page. And so this is something that I think is really important. And I've been thinking about it a lot lately. So when we're thinking about bees, and I think this goes for teachers and beekeepers, we don't want to think about um, it from a deficit perspective. So if children come in and they're sort of afraid of bees or they think it's gross or they just don't understand sort of anything about it, I think it's really important to start from a position where all students' ways of understanding nature are valid. So we don't know what their background is. We don't know what their experience is. And we certainly um, shouldn't be judging them based on any of that. And then for the second thing, consider windows of tolerance. So bees can be a scary topic and fear doesn't always resonate with all of us the same way, especially if you have a trauma uh, background, whether it's societal or collective trauma or individual trauma, um, your tolerance level for pain and fear is going to be different. So I think it's really important, especially when we're talking about bees, to consider children's windows of tolerance. What is one child sort of you know, what's going to help them grow a little bit um, and lean into their fear in a way that's safe? And how might that differ from child to child? And then the last thing is to be forever curious. So kids are curious and the more that we can be curious with them and alongside of them, uh, I think will sort of energize them. Okay. So I'm going to pause for a second and just see if there's any questions before I go into how I would typically give a workshop to kids. And you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand either way. Okay. If there are no questions, then I will continue to go through this. Um, but please stop me if you have questions because I get really bored just talking to myself on a Zoom screen. So the first thing I would do when you walk into a room, so this has to do with you becoming sort of the, um, the center of attention for the day. You are a guest that's, if you're a beekeeper, you're a guest that's coming into a, um, a space that's usually pretty comfortable for the kids that they know very well and you're sort of the outsider and the stranger so it's it helps to start by introducing yourself um, through some sort of a fun activity so for me I really enjoy books or if they're younger kids then even finger puppets for the toddler age um, and songs but this book The Honeybee and the Robber I think is a really great one to start um, with sort of you, I would do this up to 12 um or 13 and I really like it because it talks about all the things that you're going to talk about in a bee presentation really um but it gives them sort of a fun context for thinking about it before you jump right into all the facts and all of that um okay so the first thing you're going to do is introduce yourself and sort of introduce like you know why you're there what you're going to talk about um, and if you're the teacher, then you probably don't have to do this, but you can still start with a book and ask questions throughout the book to sort of get them thinking like, where does honey come from? What are the bees doing? And I should mention that today I will talk about um, mostly honeybees, but I also have some things about native bees as well. So the second thing I would do, so this is the second part of the workshop is I would um, give the kids some sort of knowledge to work with. 
And depending on their age, um, I think you can narrow this down or you can expand it depending on their age. So I think the beekeepers in the room will probably be a little bored by this, but um, hopefully the teachers maybe don't think about this as much as we do as beekeepers, but we'll see. So um, these are some of the topics I would cover in bee life. So the history of bees, uh, bees versus wasps, I think is a really important topic, especially for teachers um, to think about, because just a little bit of knowledge there goes a long ways. Um, thinking about bee casts, the bee life cycle, bee reproduction, and the superorganism theory. So for the goals here is to give children some facts. And then from here, um, after this, I set up the learning stations, and then they sort of go through the stations and can apply what they've learned here in those um, stations. So depending on how far back you want to go, I think that for me, what's uh, really cool is to start with the history of the bees and sort of start with this idea that like millions of years ago, there was, there were no bees and there were no wasps. There was this like super sort of insect thing that was both like part bee, part wasp. Um, and that's sort of where they came from. And those sort of super bee wasp things used to eat like beetles and stuff. And those beetles would be covered in pollen. And so some of those super bee wasps realize that instead of eating the beetle, they could just eat the pollen on the beetle and still kind of get all the protein that they need. And so they sort of skipped the beetle altogether and just started going to collect pollen. And so this is how bees and wasps evolved and split from each other from one sort of overhead organism. Um, and so bees have evolved then to be these like vegetarian insects. So they only eat pollen and nectar and they only feed their babies pollen and nectar. Um, whereas wasps feed their babies meat. And I think that this is a really important distinction to know um, because it's going to tell you a lot about how they behave and why wasps might be around you more um, than bees. So I like to start with a little bit of the history of the bees. Um, and then just for fun, we'll play this game. So can you tell me if these pictures are bees, wasps, Bees or wasps? So we'll start with A. Is A a bee or a wasp? And you can just bee. put it, a B. Yes. Yeah, oh, it is a bee. Does anybody know what kind of bee? Not like super specific, but just generally? Yes, it is a bumblebee. I believe this picture, I think I took it in Ireland and I think it has a white tail. I think it's some sort of white tailed bumblebee, I think from Ireland. Uh, okay, what about B? What is B? And if you know what kind, if it's a bee or a wasp, what kind of thing it is? Honeybee, it is a honeybee. So, okay, I think I must, I think that you all are jumping ahead. So C is up here. I didn't do them in order from left to right. So if you are into literacy, then I am throwing you all off here. Um, so C is this one here. What is this one? B or a wasp? No. Yes. This is a wasp. Um, a yellow jacket. This was taken in Iceland, actually. I took this back in the end of March, beginning of April. So they do have these in Iceland. Um, D, B or wasp? B. There's a B. I actually don't know what kind of bee it is. I mean, it looks kind of like a bumblebee, but I can't remember. It also could be like a digger bee. Okay, so D is a B. What about E? Wasp. Yao. Sorry, I say yao now. That's yes in Icelandic. Yes. So this is a wasp, as you can tell. Um, I'm not sure what kind it is. I'm trying to, I realize I don't take a lot of pictures of wasps. Paper wasps, yeah. Um, I should take more pictures of them. Okay, F. B or fly. A B. 
Yes, this one was taken in Pittsburgh. Okay, G, B or wasp? B. I'm sorry, I had tricked you all. <laughs> G is neither a bee or a wasp, and I didn't give you the option. It is a fly. And so that was very mean of me. I'm sorry, but it wouldn't have worked if I had said fly. I think you would have gotten it. So the point here is to show that um, there are animals in nature that mimic sort of the danger of other animals. So you can see the stripes on the yellow jacket and then the stripes here on this fly. It's trying to mimic them. Um, so it can kind of give itself the protection of the stripes, but it's not actually venomous. It doesn't have any venom in it and it can't sting you. Um, so that's what we call mimicry. And yeah, if you zoom in, you can see it's a fly. So some of the things we look for to tell the difference between flies and bees and wasps are flies typically sit with their wings a little bit more open. And then they have big eyes and then very, very short stubby. I don't know how far I can zoom in very, very short stubby antennae. Um, and that's not a rule, of course, there's always exceptions, um, but for the most part, that's how we would tell the bees. And then H, what is H? A bee, a wasp, or a fly? Wasp. Yeah. Does anybody know what kind of wasp H is? Probably don't have these in Iceland because you don't have the thing that it feeds on. So H is a cicada killer. Yeah, oh, yes. Um, and I, the first time I saw one, I was of course terrified because its stripes are so pronounced and they're quite large. They're like this large and they fly around. And so I was quite, um, yeah, a little bit scared until I you know, started reading. Sorry, F was a bumblebee, but I'm not sure what kind of bumblebee or sorry, F was a bee, but I'm not sure. I think it's a bumblebee, but I can't tell. Um, and cicada killers, so they feed their babies cicadas. So they go out and they'll sting a cicada and paralyze it and then fly home with it. And if you Google this and look up cicada killers flying with cicadas, it's pretty wild. Um, and then they lay their eggs on the cicada and then the eggs sort of hatch and eat the cicada. And then that's how they um, mature. So cicada killers are pretty amazing I think and they're really pretty and they can seem scary when they're flying around you but they don't want anything to do with you so does anybody here what do you notice between the bees and the flies here on the screen what's like some of the characteristic differences shape of the wings the shape of the wings so yeah I've never really thought about that, but I'm wondering if wings have like, or wasps have more narrow sort of wings. Yeah, more narrow, okay. Bees have hair and tend to be fuzzy. Yes. So if we zoom in on this one, you can see that even a honeybee, which at first glance might not look like it has a lot of hair, has all these uh, hairs all over its body. And what do you think the hairs do for the bee? Hold the pollen. Exactly. They hold the pollen. Um, and so this is really important. So this is why when we think about wasps and bees having sort of separated from one common ancestor, why bees have evolved to be furrier and hairier is because they need to collect all the pollen they can to feed their babies, to make their babies as big and strong as possible. And wasps don't need that. Wasps feed their babies meat which is why wasps are probably going to be, if you are having some sort of a barbecue, especially in late August or you know, into the fall, you're going to have a lot more wasps trying to join you for your barbecue because they would really, really like some meat to bring back to their nest. You don't carry around typically pollen or nectar though. So that's why bees aren't really going to be around you as much because they don't really want what you have to offer um, unless you have like something really sugary or something like that. But exactly, bees need the hair to bring home the pollen to feed their babies and wasps don't. So that's why wasps, if we zoom in, they really don't, they have some hair and they do pollinate, but not necessarily on purpose. But on their back legs, they actually have little spikes and that's where they'll stab the meat and carry it back with them unless they're a cicada killer. And then they like hug the cicada and fly with it, which is totally crazy. Um, 
but typically wasps will have some sort of a uh, spike on their back legs that they can sort of stack meat to bring home to their babies. So I think that like one place to start with kids is just by helping them to understand the difference between bees and wasps and flies um, and understanding why some might be closer to you than others. It's not because wasps just want to sting you more or want to scare you more. It's probably because you're close to meat or, um, and they are just trying to get closer to the meat as well. So I think understanding this is one really good place to start with kids and bees. Um, and of course I've talked about honeybees a lot. Unfortunately, these are all from Florida. Not unfortunately, maybe you in Florida uh, will appreciate this more. I haven't updated this since I've moved to Pennsylvania or even in Iceland, they have five species of bees now, um, five. And up until, you know, 10, 20 years ago, there was only two, um, actually three. And then they've just found two more. So Iceland has five species of bees and they're all bumblebees. Um, whereas in the U S we have 4,000 species of bees. I think Pennsylvania has like 400. I think Florida has like 300 species and around the world, <laughs> there's 20,000 species of bees. So as you can see here, um, just these pictures, there's, this is six different species of bees, um, but 20,000 in the world. And of course, we talk about the honeybee the most, but out of those 20,000, only eight species make honey. The rest are like these ones that don't make honey. Bumblebees do a little bit, but not enough that we could harvest. Um, and of those eight, seven of those honeybees are in Asia. And so what we have in Europe and Africa, and then that's now in sort of the US and North America and South America is um, all from the European honeybee originally. So yeah, and it's the only one that makes honey and it's not native to the US. So you can imagine there's a lot of um, conversation around sort of the role of the honeybee in the US. They of course have a very important agricultural role, um, but native bees are also very <laughs> important as well in both the agricultural system um, and then just general pollinating services. So these are some of the bees you might see. So again, you can with kids, you can start, if you're a teacher, you can start to look at the differences between wasps and bees. Um, and you can see that all these have some very hairy features going on and they all collect the, the pollen in different places. So the mining bee really likes to layer up all its legs with pollen. Um, the bumblebee, you'll typically see it. And this is what you have in Iceland. There's five species of bumblebees. You'll see the pollen on the back legs. Leafcutter bees, I don't think you have these in Iceland, which is probably for the best if they don't belong there, but they are really cute and they collect all their pollen um, sort of underneath their belly here. So these are the leaf cutter bees, uh, longhorn bees. I haven't seen as many, I guess, in Pennsylvania as I saw in Florida, like they were everywhere in Florida. Sweat bees are the green ones typically, but they don't have to be. Um, yeah, so there's all kinds of bees. So I think you know, understanding bees and wasps and their differences, and then starting to look at the different kinds of bees um, could be a really cool project um, for kids to do. So I'm gonna pause again and see if there are any questions yet. I've <sighs> gotten like nowhere here in, uh, in my slides, so. Okay, we're gonna keep going then. So um, for those of you who work with kids um, and maybe aren't beekeepers, you might not be as familiar with the types of honeybees that there are. So in the colony, there's the three sort of casts. So you have the queen here in the middle. She's um, the one in the hive who, she doesn't rule the hive, um, but she is sort of the important figure in the hive. And then around her are all of her daughters or the worker bees. Um, and I think one thing that's really cool that can open up a lot of conversations with kids is talking about how um, worker bees and queens evolve. And so basically they evolve from the same egg. So this bee and these bees all started out as the exact same egg. And then the difference is that these worker bees after three days were switched from, uh, or sorry, 
they were um, yeah, switched from a diet of royal jelly, which is something that they secrete from their hyperpharyngeal glands from their heads. Um, so they secrete this royal jelly and then all bee larvae eat it for three days. And then the worker bees get switched to a diet of pollen and nectar after three days. And this sort of what's referred to in the literature as castrates them, or basically it makes um, their ovaries and their reproductive organs not grow. Um, whereas the queen is kept on a diet of royal jelly, which is this creamy stuff here, and it's secreted from the heads of bees. Um, and so she has fed this her entire larval life. Um, and this is what a bee larva looks like. It's very cute. It's like a caterpillar, basically. So if you see a caterpillar, it's very similar to a bee larva. Um, so I like to do a lot of cross-species comparisons as well. Um, but this royal jelly is what the queen has fed her entire life. And she evolves into this creature here, while these ones all evolve into this or mature into this. Um, and so, yeah, I think that talking a little bit about this, of course, with older kids, you could talk about epigenetics and how basically the diet is influencing the development or the expression of genes in bees, I think is a very fascinating topic for older kids um, and adolescents, especially. And then the drones are the guys. So these are the other, the guys that we see in the hives. Um, and you will probably never see them unless you're a beekeeper because they don't, Typically, they're not out foraging on flowers or doing all the work. That's what the worker bees do. They do all the work. The drones have these big old eyes, and their goal is to mate with the queen. Um, and they typically do that in the air, and then they die. And if they don't mate, then eventually in the fall, they're kicked out of the hive because all they would do is eat honey. They wouldn't mate over the winter, so they're really not needed. Um, so they're kicked out of the hive, and then they starve to death, which was the case of my friend here on the lower left. Um, this was the fall. His services were no longer needed and he was removed from the hive um, and then died. So I think that going through this with kids is really helpful. Um, as you know, you can talk about the life cycle and here I like to compare it with butterflies. So um, if you have caterpillars or access to caterpillars as well, they start the same as eggs and then they go through their larval stages, which looks like a caterpillar. And bees do the same thing, but just in their frame here. So they get sort of bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. And then they're capped over. And this is similar to a butterfly when they're in a chrysalis or um, a moth when it's in a cocoon. It's sort of wrapped up and it goes through this complete metamorphosis. And then it comes out as an adult bee. Um, so I think comparing the, the bee life cycle to other insects is really helpful. Um, and yeah. I probably won't talk about reproduction, although this is a very interesting topic um, because I would like to get to some of the more like crops that I use that I think could be really um, helpful for working with kids. So has anybody seen these posters or does anybody have them? Ooh. Ah. So these posters are from Girl Next Door Honey. So she is based out of San Diego, California. She's an amazing beekeeper and educator. So if you go to her website here in the shop, you can find all kinds of things. Um, if you are a teacher, yeah, okay. Or you can make your own. I agree. Um, they're really good and love the talking points on the back. Agree. So I got these and then I had mine laminated. Um, so I took them to like a some sort of office shop in the US and I had them laminated so that they could kind of hold up for a lot longer because they are sort of expensive. Um, and so I felt like this was a good investment and this way I can let the kids handle them as well and I don't worry about them ripping or anything like that. Um, so I think it's like $50 for the set and then there's another add-on set that you can get that's like $30. These make it possible um, for me to do all kinds of workshops and for the kids to really see close up. Um, so. I highly recommend if you're a teacher um, getting these or if you are maybe in a group of teachers or networks, you could get one set and then sort of um, trade them out with each other. And they're really helpful for understanding what's happening with the bees. Of course, I think bumblebees are also really cool to talk about as well. Um, and they go through sort of a similar life cycle on as bees, but uh, on a smaller scale. Um, and they're eusocial, so they start with just one queen um, in the spring, and then she sort of raises a colony that then helps her out through the year. And then at the end of the year, she lays more queens. 
and um, male bees, and then they come out, mate, and then those new queens will basically hibernate until spring. Um, and so going through the life cycle here, I think is, is really um, important with kids to understand how different bees work different from honeybees. Um, pollination, I'm not going to go through, but you can uh, talk to kids about how pollination works. And I'll show you what I do for that in my, um, in my, um, yeah, learning sort of stations. And then talking about how bees are not the only pollinators, there's all kinds of things that pollinate, although bees are really good at it for the reasons we talked about earlier, because they have so much hair and they're intentionally collecting pollen. What's that? What's that? So they make them, yeah. No, I don't have no, any don't left. Have so um, you can talk about how honey is made as well. And I'll show you how I do this in my um, presentation. And then I like to talk about beekeeping a little bit, but of course, if you're not talking about honeybees specifically, then this might not be the best. Um, older children, so it seems like children have a, more of an interest in bugs when they understand the sort of um, human function that bees serve. So although we might really like bees just because of their bees and for their inherent value, for kids, it does help them to connect their understanding and appreciation for the animal or the insect to these um, to these sort of economical or human-centered outcomes. So yeah, we might have different reasons for it, um, but I think it's uh, important to also think about how kids learn and they do tend to like remember things more and um, appreciate them more at first, at least if they're connected to some sort of benefit that humans get. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the four stations that I use to teach about bees, um, but then I would love to hear from you all if you have done workshops with kids, what you do and um, yeah, what you have found to be really helpful. And so these are the four different stations. And the goals are to get kids up and moving and keep them sort of in a structured path. Um, but I split them into four groups and then I move them to these different stations. And then they have like 10 minutes or so, um, maybe eight minutes at each station as a group to sort of go through it. And then they can move on to the next station. So the goal is to have kids moving and playing with real world materials in order to integrate um, the knowledge that you've just given them. So you've talked to them about bee biology, bee history, bee cast, um, all the cool things that bees do and how they pollinate, and then maybe what it's like to be a beekeeper. And now the kids get to go use movement to learn and integrate um, all the knowledge you just gave them. So at the first station, I like to do bee life. So this is the stuff that we talked about. Um, and these are some of the props that I've used. Um, so I just found this one yesterday, which I thought was really cool. Um, although these ones aren't fuzzy, unfortunately, they do sort of have the body differences of a wasp and then the different kinds of bees. Um, so I really liked this one. This might be something I would get when I come back. I always have a life cycle one. So teaching them about the life cycle, um, even though again, these aren't fuzzy and I wish that they were, um, it's still, uh, good for them to be able to touch and, and play. And then I had this resin set with the different types of bees. So there's worker, queen, drone, the life cycles. You can see actually how small the eggs are because the bee eggs are tiny, tiny, tiny and really hard to see. Um, and then the different things that bees make. So honey, pollen or bee bread, and then wax. Um, so I would have this set up. And then I like to set up a sensorial table where just anything that kids can smell or touch, you just put on the table and let them just um, smell and touch, hopefully not taste if it's not meant to be tasted. Um, but this is where I would let kids sort of explore all the things that we just talked about with bees um, using their senses. This is also a really fun activity. So the queen spotting. Um, so for example, in this picture here, there's a single queen because in every hive, there's one queen um, and she's sort of the one in charge. This is a newly emerged queen. Um, does anybody spot her? That's yeah, really hard. She's kind of in the middle. Yes. 
Does she look like your normal queen or does she look a little different? So this is her here. And what we look for with queens is they have typically a bald thorax or a big black dot here. Um, usually they're more surrounded by bees. So there's a little bit more of a retinue or a circle around her. Um, and her wings don't quite go over the whole back of her body. They stop right about here. But this queen to me looks a little different. And I have a theory about it, but I'm curious if anybody else sees it or notices it. Yeah, so this queen had just emerged and she hadn't yet got on she hadn't yet gone on a mating flight. And so I don't know if that's why her abdomen looks so small because it looks very small here to me. Um, so yeah, that was my theory. But then I've also seen mated queens that look small, so I'm not sure. But uh, Girl Next Door Honey also sells posters as well. Again, so you can get another set. And I think this is really fun for kids um, to be able to go through and look for the queen, especially if you don't have um, one yourself. She's not very long unmated. Yes, exactly. I think that's sort of where I was going. Kids love queen spotting activities and those posters are really good from easy to hard. That's awesome. So you can give kids a little bit of everything. Um, Queens, they don't live 16 days, but they have, um, that's their life cycle. So that's how long it takes. Let me see if I can go back. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, so at this stage, from egg until the bee hatches out a queen, it takes 16 days. So the egg is laid and she's not lay, like, um, she's not laid in one of these cells. She's laid in a different cell, but um, you can kind of see it's the same fertilized egg that's laid. And then she'll go through all these stages and then be capped over. And then she comes out after 16 days, whereas drones actually take a little bit more. Um, they come out uh, after 24 days. So almost a full week later actually just over a week and then um, worker bees come out on day 21 so it's very um, regimented and yeah so queens kind of mature the fastest through this process um, but then queens themselves the queen bee can actually live like in I guess in the old days they used to live a lot longer so maybe five years um, they could live and then now typically though it depends on the beekeeper and their style of beekeeping management um, they may requeen every year. They may, um, you know, last a couple years before they're not producing like they used to. So um, their their length of life has definitely gone down a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. Those and then yes, I saw somewhere maybe um, observation hive. So if you can have access to live bees, I will say as a beekeeper, this was always terrifying to me, no matter how secure my, my bees were. It's always terrifying to have kids in there like touching, you know, or looking very closely to things. Um, I had all the sort of things and like this observation hive up here, I ended up it was created so that the, you know, the bees could sort of build out this observation thing up here, um, but it didn't work really well. And so I ended up, I would just sort of take off this top part and bring it with me to workshops and then leave the nuke at home with all the bees in it. And that seemed to work. Um, yeah, I agree. So at this, like in my stations, I would typically have an observation hive in this first sort of station. And it's where I stayed as a beekeeper because I wanted to assume responsibility for whatever happened with this observation hive. And it's really, really interesting if you have um, some, like a good frame of bees in there and you can have kids actually looking and you can look for, if the queen's in there, you can look for the queen. But you can also just see the different parts of the hive and all the products and the pollen and maybe even the eggs and then maybe the different kinds of bees if there's some drones in there. And so observation hives are really great, but you can also get them for bumblebees as well. So I think these are really cool. Um, 
this is actually from a place in Iceland called Freitheimer, and it's a um, tomato greenhouse farm. And they have all of these bumblebees colonies that live in there. Um, and then they're all in these observation boxes. And these are so cool as well. So this might be a little bit um, less of an investment of time and money if you're interested in getting something for their, um, either the classroom or yeah, something that you can bring in to share with kids. That's not a full-blown honey hive or honey beehive, which requires obviously a beekeeper um, and a lot more sort of time. Um, these bees are also really cool, but I have done a lot of great workshops without live bees and it's still just as exciting, but I will say that this is a game changer when you bring them in. They do love to see the bees in live. Yeah, so, and I see like ours, mine had little like uh, locks on the side, which was not smart because anybody could just unlock them. So I had to tape those, but then even the ventilation holes, if kids put their fingers in the ventilation holes, like bees could easily sting them. Um, yeah, so it was just being really, um, and then I felt bad, you know, the bees had no ventilation for as long as I had them in there, I would have to tape off those ventilation holes. So um, yeah, it was always for me a little bit nerve wracking, but I know that the benefits outweighed the cost in that case. Um, the bumblebee hive name again. So I actually don't know where to get this, but I will um, look into this and send it out when we send out the email because I'm really interested in this as well. So this was in Iceland um, and they had them imported from somewhere. And I know in Jacksonville, at least, I had a friend who used to raise bumblebee colonies like this. Hers weren't in observation hives like this, um, but these ones are really cool because you could just leave them outside and then they have little doors on them that you basically open. And then same thing like an observation hive. If you want to bring it to a classroom, you just close and seal the doors. Man Lake Man sells them. Um, okay, do they sell them with the bees? The bumblebees, I mean, not, not honeybees. I'm going to look into this more. Um, I think one thing to know especially obviously with honeybees, it's a lot of work to keep honeybees. It's not something you just get, um, you know, uh, I would say it requires a lot of time and money investment. Um, and so I know that bumblebees are probably a lot less time and money and sort of investment in caretaking, but they will still require caretaking. It's not something you can just get and sort of keep outside, um, or in a classroom somewhere, like you will have to invest some knowledge or some time into learning about them. Um, the second station that I do is called pollination station. And so for this one, we talk about the link between flowers and honey. And so bees go out and they pollinate flowers, right? And this is a win-win. So the bees get the nectar and the pollen, and then the flowers get to be uh, reproduced since they can't move. They really rely on bees to do the reproduction for them and to help, um, yeah. Uh, fertilize, you know, their neighbor friend plant of a different sex. So pollination is really important for the plants and for the bees. Um, so at this station, what I do is I set up a planting station and I let children plant a plant. Um, usually it's some sort of squash or sunflower, something with a really big single seed that they can see and touch really well. Um, and then I'll have all kinds of information at this station. So here I have dried sunflower heads in a bucket. And so that way they can see sort of where the seeds come from and they're not just coming out of a package. So I really like doing it this way where I have a whole bucket full of dried sunflower seeds um, and they can pick them off the flower themselves and then they see what it looks like and then they plant it in some sort of plant that they can take home. <clears throat> and then I sort of go through the life stage of the flower and what they can expect and what they'll need to do. And I have them do this before they try the honey. So the whole thing is that without flowers, there's no honey. So they go through this station of planting a flower, something they can take home to remind them of this. And it doesn't matter if the flower dies or it doesn't make it. We're just planting seeds here, literally and figuratively. Um, and then only after they've planted the seed, then they can try the honey. And because you need flowers to make honey, this made sense to me to do. Um, and I think with older kids, what's really fun to do is have like a honey tasting. So this was with younger kids, I think 
keep it simple, maybe two options of honey, see if they can tell the difference. But with older kids, um, I think you can do this sort of honey tasting um, and have all different kinds of honey and then, you know, have them do like sort of an official thing with a piece of paper where they sort of write out the different profiles of the honeys that they taste um, and then rank them or vote on them and have like a competition. So there's all kinds of things you can do um, as children get older. And then the final thing, or not final thing, um, the next thing I would do is this be a keeper. Um, and so this station is really fun. You just bring in any and all equipment. My recommendation is that if you're doing this outside, just be wary that you might have bees showing up and not too long. So make sure that you um, have a plan for that. Like these were both in Florida. And of course, it didn't take long for bees to actually find this because they operate on a very good sense of smell. And these uh, boxes smelled like bees. So they were kind of quick to come around. So just know that if you have these things sitting outside, you could attract bees. Um, but if you do it inside, you don't have to worry about that. But bring all kinds of equipment. Obviously, kids love to dress up and play beekeeper. Um, this was always a really successful sort of station. And then the last thing I would do, and I think this one's really important and maybe overlooked quite a bit, is this sort of re like art journaling basically, or be journaling and be reflections. So at this station, I would have any kind of information set up. So I would have pictures of all the different kinds of bees, pictures of what we talked about, um, things to just inspire their reflections, any sort of information that you might have, and then all kinds of drawing things in paper. Um, in some cases I made like journals. And so they could sit down and then for kids, I think this is really important to be able to journal and draw or talk about what you learned about and reflect on it. So I really liked making these journals that kids could take home with them. Um, but then it basically looks like this, where you just give them all this space and just let them be inspired and think and write about what they've learned and what's inspired them. Um, and I think that this is one of my most favorite journal reflections from a kid ever after one of our workshops. We asked them just, you know, to draw a picture or talk about what they learned. And this could learn that bees are awesome. And I thought that this was just the best reflection. This is another kind of artwork that we've done. So you can use um, an exit ticket. What's an exit ticket? Can you tell us more about that? Hi, um, this is Susan, and yeah. uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Took a minute to get <laughs> to get on uh, get on point. Um, an exit ticket, basically, it's a it's a one quarter size piece of paper. It's got a little picture of, of a fun little cartoon on it, and it asks three things. The first one is um, honey. It's all about when they taste the honey, they have to tell me honey tastes sweeter than, and it's fill in the blank. Nice, but not as sweet as fill in the blank. And so some, it's interesting because some of the kids, uh, like the, we did a Parks and Rec um, camp last week, and the kids had already had lunch when we got there. And so some of them had candy. And of course, the honey tasted kind of sour to them. So that was kind of fun. Um, okay. Talking about, you know, tasting. So that actually worked out pretty good. Um, and it also has, um, there in the presentation, we do a, a slide on, it's actually three slides on what the kids can do right now to, to help honeybees. Um, and one of them is do nothing. You know, that would be don't bother them, walk away, don't swat at them. Um, another one is, you know, make sure that if, you, if your parents are using pesticides, that you follow the directions on the labels. And most of them have pollinator um, warnings on them of how to apply them. And so we ask the kids for those three, three of those 10 things that they can do. And um, it's really great because it's very quick and they have to hand that in in order to get the last prize for their prize bag, which is a set of three stickers and they love those. So it uh, seems to yes. work out pretty well. I love that idea so much. Those are great questions. So thank you for sharing them. And I'm glad that they're on this recording now so that people can use them. Uh, yeah, no worries. Yeah, I think this is like, I'm not obviously going to have time to go into any of these, but there were ideas for how to help the bees um, and things that you can do um, as far as like creating wildlife areas. I don't know why this is so blurry. Um, looking into homes for native bees and how different native bees grow, um, different 
plants to plant for bees. Um, this is one of my favorite things to do is to make like a watering hole for bees. But I think just related to what you were talking about, Susan, I think it's really important today. I was out um, walking around Norway and I noticed that what I do is I actually hear bees before I see them. Um, and I think that it can be really fun for kids instead of waiting until you see a bee to then sort of decide you can sort of start to learn um, where they might be. So looking for flowers and then also what they sound like and listening to them. Um, and then that way, you know, kids can be sort of on the lookout for them before they just sort of appear. And I think that that can be helpful um, for kids thinking about just, you know, instead of like seeing a bee, of course, what you said, like, don't do anything, don't swat, don't touch it, um, don't do anything like that. But if you can learn to predict where the bees are going to be, it might turn into a fun kind of adventure to see if you could find them. Um, okay, I'm going to leave it here. These are some of my favorite resources um, before I end. So this book on the left here is one of my, I mean, just if you work, work in classrooms and work with kids, this book is amazing. It will tell you all the cool facts about bees and then also all the cool things to do with kids um, about to teach them about bees. So I highly recommend this book. I really, really like it. Um, and then, yeah, some other resources that might be helpful for you. Um, thinking about Pollinator Week, I hope that you can join in for some of the other um, activities that we're going to be doing. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to see if there's any questions. And of course, we are at time. It's now for me, it's 7.02 p.m. I think in the U.S. it's 1.02 p.m. Iceland, somewhere in between. Um, but if you have any questions or specific questions about anything I said or ideas you have, um, if you have any ideas you would like to share with the group and you can put them in the chat, I think that would be awesome. Um, but I also understand that we're at time, so I want to let people go. Um, oh, thanks, Terry. <laughs> That is a very big compliment. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope to sort of develop this, this workshop a little bit more and do it more in the future. Um, yeah, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day wherever you are in the world. Uh, Heather, there will be a recording of this and then that will go out to everyone um, who registered. So yeah, you will get the full recording. Sleep.